Welcome back to Oliver's Greenhouse. I've got some, it's almost unbelievably serene in the house. Both the kids are in bed, it's asleep, the wife's out, and uh, I finally got some time to do some content which is unrushed and hopefully not interrupted by small children. So, been making a lot of videos recently, we're just trying to catch up. We've had basically two weeks of no videos, so I've really been trying to push forward with uh, getting some more content out for you guys. So in this video, we're gonna be doing a rare carnivorous plant unboxing video. So the weather's really good at the moment. I've just got, the carnivorous plants are looking great. So I'm really enjoying them at the moment. And uh, it's been a little while. I know most of you are predominantly into orchids. Well, I certainly get them from the amount of likes I get on the videos that I make. It would appear that most of you guys really like the, um, the orchids more than the carnivorous plants. but. I'm not quite so strict as, you know, I'm not so, I love my orchids and they are primarily what I enjoy growing, but I also really like carnivorous plants and like to spend a lot of time cultivating them because I find them so fascinating. Um, so yeah, I, I basically bought some more carnivorous plants. Well, there's one carnivorous plant here. It's quite an unusual one as well. So we're going to have a little look at that in a minute. We'll unbox it and have a look. There's also some seeds in here as well. So that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, so, and particularly tricky to grow, or certainly ones to get to germinate. So we're going to be going through a process of how to, basically from what I've read, how to go ahead and get these guys to germinate. So it's a bit getting a bit late in the season. So I'm hoping for germination before the, the heady heights of summer. So these guys can sit outside and really enjoy um, the maximum amount of uh, sunlight because as you know most kind of us plants apart from a few tropical ones um, really like full sun a good eight hours solid sunshine all day and they will thrive beautifully but um, as some of you may know I've been doing my kitchen and that's partly part of the reason with the big hold up with content and also just a general delay on building the thing it's been an absolute pain in the backside um, about seven years ago um, some of you may have already deduced or may already be aware I was a tree surgeon for the best part of 20 years um, before basically every part of my body that did articulate became really bad at articulating so basically my body, my skeletal structure started to fall apart so I had to give it up, went back to college, retrained and now I am a tree consultant so I spend all of my time providing consultancy services for lots of private domestic clients, also a large number of um, big companies as well, doing a lot of trees and planning. Um, so I, basically, that, that's what I do. I go out, look at trees, write reports, and talk to people. And it's great, I really enjoy my job. But before that, I did climb trees for a living. And um, many years ago, I felt a big macrocarpa. And my good friend John and I went back on a weekend with a milling jig on a big 8.8 steel chainsaw and we cut a load of slabs um, out of this big stem of a tree. I took them up to the log store and they went in a big barn and they sat there for well, best, well seven years basically to dry out really slowly um, so they didn't warp and go a funny shape. And the intention always was, was to put them in the kitchen in my forever house. And since moving here, this is, we are not going to be going. The school's really good around here and there's no, we don't have any intention of going anywhere. And so the whole plan from seven years ago was to save these tops and put them in my new kitchen, which is what I've been working on apart from the massive hold up by the supplier, but that's fine, it's in material, it's, it's done now. Well, it's not finished, but I've done a lot of it. The carcasses are all built on the wall. So I thought actually, because human beings are being naturally nosy creatures, some of you might want to have a look at what I've been up to. So last weekend, it was basically a whole weekend of milling these planks of timber to turn them into usable worktops, because I love timber, I think it looks amazing. And um, I thought you guys might want to have a look and see what I've been up to. I'll pick you guys up. I'll move you over there. It's not finished yet, there's no tiles on the wall and stuff, but um, the, the worktops look amazing. And it's best to take a, record it now before the kids, the wife and life happens around them because obviously it's a working kitchen, it's not a showroom, you know what I mean? It's always gonna be used, so it can't be too precious, but it looks brilliant at the moment. So uh, I'll move you guys and we'll have a look. Okay, so I thought I'd do 
the big reveal, that's usually where I stand with the green background or no, no fancy 3D effects or anything like that, it's just a blind, in case any of you were wondering. But I thought I'd turn around and give you guys a bit of a sweep shot, there's all the crud on the dresser. We pan around here, we can start to see the golden luster of my new worktops. Now these are all solid pieces of macro carpa. Um, there's the new wall units over the other side. No door front on the uh, dishwasher in the corner there yet. And uh, most of the carcasses, there's no backs on them. They're just on, the, on their little plastic legs. But here's the timber that I've been putting in. I'll move you guys in a little bit closer. You'll be able to see quite how beautiful this stuff came up. It looks absolutely fantastic. I mean, the film doesn't really do it, do it justice, to be honest, but it is literally glowing. Beautiful slabs, really lovely um, grain to them. Over here is where my John, my, my John, my good friend John, cut out the uh, sink recess over here, just with a router, just for the sink to pop into. Some of these big, uh, these, these big knots got filled with resin and then sanded to give them a nice glassy, so it's actually flush, it's all nice and flat. Looks absolutely fantastic. But my favourite bit, oh yeah, nice new, nice new oven close up. That needs to be hoiked up so it's the same level as the rest of the worktops. My favourite bit, I've also left all the, uh, I've left the um, sapwood on the edge here as well. So you've got, that we realistic, you've actually got knots. If I pull over onto this side, scroll down, you'll probably be able to see. I've left knots in the timber. as well so you've got this lovely it catches the eye you've got these lovely little details where the branch stub ends were looks absolutely fantastic and then i've continued that sapwood all the way down along the front and faces of both sides of the worktops so it looks really smart i'm really happy with it but my favorite bit which we'll go over and have a look at now and then i promise we'll get on with the rest of the video is over here yeah, so this bit over here, this is, this is like Ripple City over here. This is where a great big limb came off the tree and uh, it's been hewn off here and then planked and it's brought out this lovely grain. It almost doesn't look real. Over this side here is particularly nice where uh, the um, oil I've used on it has really given the wood an almost unbelievable luster. It just looks absolutely stunning in here. So yeah, really, really happy with the worktops. So they've actually, they've panned out an absolute treat. It's another nice bit here. Looks really, really good. So, zoom you guys out. That's enough uh, ogling of the unfinished kitchen. Although, I'm going to be getting on with it a lot this weekend. So, hopefully have it all done and dusted by the end of play uh, next week. Okay, so enough going on about the, uh, the worktops. I really just can't explain quite how happy I am with them. They turned out really well. So especially after seven years of uh, them drying in a mouldy shed. So, super happy with that. But now let's get on for the real reason why you're actually all here. Let's have a look at what's in my box. Because it's gonna be, I've got another ridiculously big knife for this. Remember, always cut away from yourself. Um, so I got these from a company or nursery here in the UK called Triffid um, Carnivorous Plants, and I'll put a link in the video description as well. So you guys can, they've got an amazing selection of carnivorous plants for all you guys out there who are into them. Literally, it's probably the best in the UK. They also do a lot of seeds as well, which really opens up corridors. Well, I, I, I prefer to be able to, to, it's almost like a challenge, isn't it? It's nice to be able to grow things yourself, be like, I grew that from seeds, you know, rather than I just bought that as a whole plant. Although one of them, there is actually a whole plant in here, so, but I, I can assure you, um, I much prefer to grow things from seeds where possible, my carnivorous plants anyway. Um, so I'm sure these are all gonna be in little bags. Here are the seeds. Oh, there seems to be a lot of seeds in here. Let's read what it says. Uh, so here's a letter from, from, from Triffid Carnivorous Plants here. They're up in Suffolk uh, and it reads, Dear Oliver, Thank you for your order. Please find enclosed the various plants and seeds that you recently ordered, which I hope have arrived in good condition and grow well for you. If you have any questions about how to cultivate carnivorous plants, then please visit our website, nice pitch, and have a look through the care section. Never use tap water. Stand your plant permanently in two centimeters of rainwater between January and November. Keep soil just damp from November until January. 
If you're unhappy with any of the goods supplied to us or wish to cancel this order, cancel this order, it's here. Um, then please read our returns policy. Ah, right, now it makes sense. And download a cancellation form, blah, 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 blah. Um, kind regards, Andy uh, and Alison Wilkinson. So thank you very much for that. And then we've just got a list in here of what it is that I ordered. And I've ordered some pretty rare plants. And um, so I think some of them are going to be a real challenge, okay? So I've ordered Drosera brumensis um, as seeds. So then these are a lot, a lot, what I like about these, a lot of these are named locations. So these actually come from, they've been collected in the wild, cultivated, produced seeds. So Drosera brumensis, uh, Taylor's Lagoon Kimberley, now obviously from Australia. I doubt very much I'm going to be able to find a, um, a royalty free image of that, but if I can, I'll put it in the video about now. And if I haven't, you'll just have to use your imagination or Google it. I'll put the name in the video so you can have a look. The next thing I've got, I've been meaning to try this species or this genus for a long time, is Biblis gigantea. And this comes from a fantastic place. It's called Bibulum Track WA, Western Australia. I guess Western WA, Western Australia make, makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, another very unusual one, which you hardly ever see, uh, is, uh, oh yeah, also... I should be able to find a royalty-free image of Biblis Gigantia, so I'll put that in the video now. Um, another one which is also very rare, um, or a very unusual growth, is Drosera Hartmayorum, Hartmayorum uh, from Kunarura, Kimberley, Western Australia. And now that's named after the Hartmayers. They are a they are basically German carnivorous plant enthusiasts. They've made a series, quite a few videos, um, and they work very carefully with the International Carnivorous Plant Society. Um, and they've actually had this named after them. It's got unusual, uh, like golden um, balls which emanate from near where the leaf axials meet the stem, and they sort of reflect under uh, under certain light conditions. They reflect light, and it basically they think it lures insects onto the carnivorous plant, which is really, really clever, and I don't really see it on anything else. And the other thing, the big expenditure is, I bought one of the very few, what is considered to be carnivorous, uh, or carnivorous, um, um, uh, what's it called? Bromeliads. So I brought a Brachinia reductor. So, I think there's only a few which are considered to be carnivorous. Brachinia reducta, which is native to like Venezuela and um, places in Brazil, it basically grows on top of tepus, uh, which are those big limestone outcrops that sort of jut up for hundreds of meters basically out of the rainforest. And they grow up there with lots of other really unique carnivorous plants. And they basically have developed their growth as they grow a cone of tightly knit leaves like this, which fills full of water. And uh, it's got sort of like a waxy, loose, scaly side. So the insects land on it, drop inside, drown, and um, are, are then digested by the plant. Although they, I don't think they found the typical enzymes that they associate with the uh, consumption and breaking down of uh, animals until I think they found some uh, phosphase or something like that. Or well, they found something which helps to break down the bodies of the insects recently and then obviously transports nitrogen through the cell wall into the plant for um, for, for, for use by the plant. So that's quite um, quite interesting. And I've actually had to ask a few other growers basically about the media for this. There's actually not a lot of information on them. I know they only live for a certain amount of time, so they'll grow for, I think, two years. Then they bloom, and then after they bloom, they die. But shortly before they bloom, um, or during the blooming phase, they produce lots of little pups, so you get lots of new little plants forming from around the bottom of it. So this should be quite an interesting challenge. They like really high light. So you've got to think about these TPUs, these great big mountains of limestone. They're often shrouded in mist. They're very, very humid and actually quite cold as well because they're that much higher up. They haven't got the oppressive heat of the rainforest down below. So it's going to like highlight and cool temperatures, which is tricky to do, especially in a plastic box in the, in the garden. Um, but the Nepenthes I grow are mainly highland, so they like nice and humid, bright light and cool temperatures. So hopefully this guy should grow uh, with them quite well. So that's in here. We should see what's actually in the box now. So we've got the seeds. They're all here. I'll lay these out so we can have a closer look at them in a bit. So here we go. We've got 
put this one stuck together. There's the Drosoma brumensis. Uh, and that's saying I should probably get some GA3 for that, which is gibberellic acid. Uh, and what that helps is it helps to break down the hard casing of the seed, um, which then will then enable it to germinate uh, a lot easier. I'm just feeling very gently. They feel quite big. So it might be actually, I might be able to soak these because uh, I don't have any gibberellic acid. Um, neither do I really want to purchase any at the moment as I'm going to have to pay to finish the kitchen off. Uh, Biblish Gigantia, Bibulum track. Uh, three seeds in this pack and uh, these are going to be really interesting because you need to do fire treatment on these is the best is I've read up about them and the most successful way of doing this I'll put a link to uh, some information I found on the internet in the description of this video basically you have to sow these onto your media so peat, it's a very sandy peaty mix um, for about and leave them on there for about two weeks making sure they get pretty good contact um, with the uh, with, with the peat maybe put a thin layer on top and then after two weeks, what we need to do is light a small fire actually on top of the seed. So we need some like grass and some leaves. We want quite a quick burning fire. Something that's only going to burn for sort of like, I don't know, 30 seconds, something like that, just to scorch them. And then they rely on seeds, uh, rely on bushfires basically to soften up the hard casing of the seed and to stimulate germination. There's also some of the uh, chemicals that is given off by the smoke also, also helps to stimulate um stimulate germination so these are going to be interesting i've only got three so it's like get it right or don't get it right or, or just ruin it basically uh, and the next thing we've got is drosera heart mayorum heart mayorum heart mayorum that's a mouthful and a half anyway so i've got these I've got five seeds in there so that's really really good i'm looking forward to these very unusual i don't know many people who are growing this so we'll have a good go like i say Trifford have got some really unusual species and very interesting plants, so it's, I, you should check out their website. It's very, very good. And I've bought plants from them before. Um, actually, my, my Drossa Regia, my King Sanji, came from these guys quite some time ago, and that thing's just doing brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly, uh, in the greenhouse at the moment. So we'll pop that over there. And then in here, underneath all this newspaper, is going to be my Brachinia. There's lots and lots of shredded paper. Okay, so in here, very well packed. It's even got a protective little plastic cup over the top of it as well to keep it safe. Make sure there's nothing else in there. Doesn't look like it. Good. Right, pop that in there like that. fantastically well packed that's the main thing because i post i do sell there's actually i need to do it this weekend i need to do a big purge in the greenhouse i've got far too many conovas plants that need to be sold and i've also got loads of seeds as well i've got some drosera venusta and also some uh drosera filiformis vartracei seeds well they're not seeds they're, they are but they're on the flower spikes and it's all starting to dry out so before they get knocked accidentally and spill everywhere like this weekend i'm going to go around with a pair of scissors and some a4 paper and take each one off fold it up, write what's on there, and pop it in the airing cupboard to dry out, and then I'll be able to knock all those seeds out. So I should have some really cool seeds up for sale on my on my eBay quite soon for all of those of you which are who are located in the UK or the EU, um, as long as we're still, for, as whilst as we are still part of the EU. Never before did I think in all my years that we would end up not being part of the EU. It still makes me intensely sad. But we are leaving. I was obviously a Remain voter. I'm going to stick my neck out on the line there. So here we are. This is all, all in this little um, pot here with a tag and nicely taped on as well. So I've got to be a little bit careful here not to cut my fingers. Hmm. Got to be careful. Aha. There he is, my little brachinia. That's pretty cool. Just a wee seedling at the moment. Well, not a seedling, a small plant at the moment. These guys do get pretty big. What I'll do is I'll put, if I haven't already, I'll put a picture of these in the video now so you can have a look at what they look like and you'll be able to see the really tightly knit, almost like yellow cone of leaves um, that they produce, which is what they form their pitfall traps in. This isn't probably not big enough yet to hold water. So it holds water in the center of the rosette of leaves. Wow, it's really well wrapped. These guys know how 
to package a parcel. This is really very impressive. And box tape, as we all know, is almost indestructible. Oh my goodness. There was no way this was getting damaged in the post. No way. Everyone hold your breath. You might be able to see Oliver's Greenhouse Bleeding Edition. Okay, so I'm gonna go that far over there. You'll have to leave me with this for a minute because uh, it's gonna be a little bit tricky to get undone, I think. Right, okay, there we have it. So that's him out of the uh, all, all that mess, all the box tape and stuff. I'm not gonna lift him up because it's very, very wet. So it's nice and nice and moist for transit. So it's kept it in really good condition. And uh, part one of the reasons I did contact some other growers was because uh, I wasn't entirely sure what sort of uh, media I was gonna, is it exactly the same as a normal carnivorous plant? Am I gonna use peat and perlite? And that's pretty much what this has come in. It looks, I can see some grains of perlite in here and some peat. So. There's your answer for media. Peat and perlite seems to be the way forward. So uh, that's what this guy's going. Like I said, I've got no experience with this plant. It's completely new to me. So it will be uh, an interesting challenge. My, re my reasoning behind it was, is if I can grow Highland and Penthes, then I can probably grow these. So uh, let's give it a try. So look, coming back to carnivorous bromeliads, I think the only other one that's assumed to be carnivorous is Catopsis. Uh, Betroniana, Betroniana, I'm probably merging that. Let's see if I can find it on my phone. Complete cheat here. Because uh, I was reading a little bit about this um, before I made this video, strangely enough, so I didn't just spout a load of gobbledygook at you. It is, no, it's Catopsis Betroniana, which is another form of suspected carnivorous um, bromeliad. Uh, although that, I think, collects water in the axials of the leaves and insects fall in there. Uh, and drown rather than falling in like a, a pitfall trap in the center of the plant. What I'll do is I'll lay these out and uh, move you guys in. We'll have a little look at them a bit closer up. Okay, so here's the sum of the uh, sum of this haul anyway. So we've got Drosera brumensis, Drosera heart mayorum, heart mayorum, mayorum. I don't know. I can't say that word. It just escapes me. Biblis, Biblis gigante. I'm very excited about those guys. And uh, here is the uh, here is our bromeliad. So, what is I zoom in on it? Move this out of the way, on the new worktops, and we'll have a little look at it close up. And you can see what it looks like. Just jiggle you over. So, hopefully, you'll be seeing the plant there without it focusing on everything else, bar the plant. So, here it is. This is what it looks like. And then what happens is it forms a rosette down there. You can almost see where that light area is there. When it gets much, much bigger, that's where the water will collect and where it captures its prey, or doesn't capture its prey, depending on whether this thing is actually carnivorous. Um, although the consensus amongst specialists is that it is to some degree. So there we go. So there we have it. Hope you've enjoyed this video. I know I prattled on about the worktops and the kitchen, but it's just basically been a godsend and like the bane of my existence for like two weeks. Um, I'm really excited about this carnivorous plant. I'm also really excited about trying out those seeds over there. We're gonna be doing lots of updates on those and uh, keeping you guys in the loop on how they're going. And there's certainly some very interesting species there, certainly ones that I've never grown before. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, I hope you guys are as well. Thank you for watching. Uh, don't forget to give us a thumbs up like down below if you've enjoyed this video. Also leave a comment. It's really good to uh, communicate with you guys and uh, it's quite fun. I really enjoy it. And uh, make sure you tune in uh, again next time. Thanks for watching.